In the early 1800s, early French explorers of the Pacific Northwest brought back reports of Native Americans in possession of forged iron tools that were not of European craft. The Chinookan tribes of modern-day Washington and Oregon even had their own native word for metal, called Gaez. How could this be, when even in the heart of the Aztec Empire, the most technologically advanced civilization in the Americas at the time of first contact, did not possess iron metallurgy technology and primarily utilized Stone Age tools and weapons with limited use of bronze tools? Turns out, for centuries predating the arrival of Europeans to the New World, drift iron from Chinese and Japanese shipwrecks were quite common in the Pacific Northwest. Native Americans in the region were unique in the New World in developing their own ironwork technology from scavenging iron along the coastline. But in rarer instances, these Asian shipwrecks brought more to America than just pieces of metal. They brought Asians, too. Perhaps the most dramatic of cases is the story of three Japanese castaways, Iwakichi, Kyukichi, and Otokichi in 1834. A rice transport ship named Hojun Maru departs from Mihama to Edo with a crew of 14 men. Shortly after their departure, an ill-fated storm strikes Japan's east coast, and the ship's mast gets busted, and the vessel is blown off course eastbound. With no rudder to control their trajectory, the ship and its crew are at the mercy of the Pacific Ocean's currents and are dragged far out into the abyss of the vast Pacific. Fortuitously, the vessel's cargo hall holds 150 tons of rice, an endless supply of carb-heavy calories, a keto fiend's worst nightmare. However, with no fresh meat or produce, as the weeks pass, men begin succumbing to scurvy. No, suck on a lemon. Here, go ahead. Well, they are good for scurvy. All right, I have a few lemons, but then I'm out of here. <sighs> Only three sailors remain, Iwakichi, age 33, Kyukichi, age 20, and Otokichi, age 19. In January of 1834, after 14 months at sea, the ship wrecks at Cape Alava along the Washington coast. Not long after, Maka Indians arrive to scavenge the ship and find the hysterical and land-deprived sailors near the wreckage. While the Japanese men would briefly be enslaved by the Indian tribesmen, they were also cared for and nursed to better health with fresh food, water, and clothing. When the staff at the British Hudson Bay Company headquarters at Fort Vancouver catch wind of the shipwreck, they dispatch a rescue team. To their astonishment, they arrive to the scene to find that the ship is not only not of British, American, French, or even Russian origin, but of a completely foreign oriental design. Eventually, the Native Americans would seek out the British chief factor of the Columbia District, John McLaughlin, and hand the castaways over. At this time, Japan was in the midst of the Edo period, where foreign policy revolves around Sakoku, locked country, in which the nation practices extreme isolationism. Foreign nationals are banned from Japan, and common Japanese citizens are forbidden from traveling abroad. Few Europeans know anything about Japan, its people, or its culture, so the British rescuers believe the men to be from China, noting that the cruise vessel contained items with Chinese writing on them. With few Japanese ever even leaving Japan, let alone the continent of Asia, the three sailors are equally, if not more, bewildered with the situation, having no idea how far from home they really are. Not to mention, few Japanese at this time, particularly amongst commoners, had ever laid eyes on Europeans. And now, not only had these men interacted with Europeans, but their arrival to Washington is the first ever recorded interaction between Japanese and Native Americans. After spending some time in the Pacific Northwest, the men begin learning English and explain their origin story to the British. Did you know I am from Japan? Mate, you said you was from China! No, white man just racist. How was I supposed to know? McLaughlin, after learning the men are Japanese, envisions using the castaways as an opportunity to open trade between Britain and Japan. He puts them on a ship routed around Cape Horn at the southern tip of South America, bound for London.
The men arrived to Britain, the first Japanese to step foot on the island in nearly two centuries. Unfortunately, the British government shows little interest in McLaughlin's ambitions and turns down the idea of trying to use the men to open relations with Japan. Instead, the British decide to send the men to the Portuguese colony Macau in China. Close enough, right? After another long and exhausting journey around Africa's Cape of Good Hope, around the Indian subcontinent, and through Southeast Asia, the men finally return to the Far East. All in all, from the day they set out from Mihama, the men have traveled nearly 40,000 miles by sea. After returning to Asia, the men are discovered by an American trader, Charles W. King, who also wants to try his luck at using the castaways as bargaining chips and opening trade relations between the U.S. and Japan. They board an unarmed ship and arrive to Uraga outside of Edo Bay, where they are fired upon by Japanese troops. King then reroutes the ship to Kagoshima and is once again met with cannon fire, forcing the men to abandon their goals of getting into Japan. Realizing that no Japanese ports will permit any foreign ships to dock, and having witnessed firsthand how serious the shogunate government is in enforcing their isolationist policies, the Japanese men begin growing concern for their fate should they step foot back home. As the act of leaving the country is punishable by death. Should local Japanese officials not believe their far-fetched story of journeying literally around the world, they may be executed. Demoralized, the Japanese men begin coming to the realization that they must start new lives abroad. Returning to Macau, the men begin working as translators for the British trade legation. From here on, Iwakichi and Kyukichi's stories fade into the shadows of history. No further records mention their whereabouts. The youngest of the three survivors, Otokichi, however, moves to Shanghai to work for a British trading company while also working as a crewman on American ships, helping Japanese castaways return to Japan. Otokichi marries a Scotswoman who later dies of illness. His second wife, Louisa Belder, is half German and half Malay with Singaporean citizenship with whom they have a son and three daughters. Through this marriage, Otokichi becomes a naturalized British subject, taking the name John Matthew Otteson. Otteson being a transliteration of Otto-san, literally Mr. Otto in Japanese. After 17 long years away from home, Otokichi finally returns to Japan as a translator for the English Royal Navy. During his time overseas, Japan has changed much, but is still controlled by the strict shogunate government. Still fearing possible punishment from Japanese authorities for leaving the country, and now being able to speak Chinese fluently from his years abroad, he disguises himself as a Chinese man, fabricating a story to have learned Japanese from his father, who had done business in Nagasaki. Six years later, he would return to Japan again, this time under his British name, Otteson, under the command of Admiral James Sterling, who uses Otokichi as a translator in negotiating the Anglo-Japanese Friendship Treaty in Nagasaki, opening trade relations between Britain and Japan. With Japanese isolationism gradually falling out of favor within Japan, officials offer Otokichi amnesty, allowing him to return home, but he refuses, now having deep family roots in Shanghai. Otokichi moves to his wife's native island, where he becomes the first known Japanese resident of Singapore. He and his family live in a luxurious colonial estate after acquiring significant wealth from the British government for his role in negotiating the treaty with Japan, as well as from his successes in his business ventures in Shanghai. In 1867, Otokichi dies of tuberculosis. Half of his remains are buried in Singapore, and the other half is returned back to his hometown of Mihama by his family, where in death, he finally returns home. Thanks so much for watching, but listen, while I enjoyed making this video, it's a tremendous commitment of time and effort as I'm a one-man show. If you enjoyed this, please consider liking and subscribing so I can continue making more content.